ascites related to the liver disease or whether there is ascites related to other cardiac causes which are there. And, and the only way you can differentiate that is by doing a tap sometimes in these children. And you know, the, obviously there are causes of high drops fetalis, but in cardiac failure, especially the congenital heart disease, you can sometimes uh, see ascites. And one of the th times when we have seen ascites is when there is hemangioma, which leads to cardiac failure, which leads to hypoalbuminemia, which leads to ascites. That's usually a very late presentation, but we've seen it on a couple of occasions. Intrauterine infections, not so common, and metabolic disorders don't actually present in the neonatal period, but they are neonatal problems which then present at a later age group. The initial assessment is always the same. You have to assess their ABCs. Is this child alert enough to protect the airway? Is the distension causing any breathing problems or respiratory distress? And is the circulation compromised? Because what we have to remember is children with ascites look wet from outside, but they are dry from the inside because their effective circulatory blood volume is less. A baseline weight and abdominal girth and a follow-up of this is crucial. And is there fever or rebound tenderness? Because that's quite important to exclude spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And then there are a host of differentials which you can consider depending on your approach uh, uh, to the child. And, and you know, generally the first thing that you see in a child is, is the child got generalized edema or is this ascites just restricted to the abdomen? And then you go on to see whether the child has got jaundice, hepatitis planomegaly and other uh, uh, problems which are there. What investigations will be do you do when you, pr you are presented a child with ascites is the first investigation you will do is, uh, you, you know, I will, uh, I will do a urine dipstick just to make sure that this is not, uh, because that's a simple test you can do uh, in, the, uh, in the clinic itself. And then you order a battery of blood tests, including a complete blood count. You know, you would have seen whether the child is anemic or not by your clinical examination. And depending on what you find, then you have to modify your tests accordingly. But because this is a PGI and liver-related talk, I've tried to phase it around the liver-related investigations. And like I say, liver function test, total protein albumin, and the hepatitis virus profiles, which has been highlighted, uh, you know, in the previous talk. BUN and creatinine is uh, uh, quite an important test to, to do because you want to make sure that the renal function of this child is preserved and amylase because pancreatitis can be easily missed. Lipase is not some uh, first line investigation, usually a second line investigation you will do. And if you are not sure about the diagnosis of ascites, then sometimes a radiologic study and ultrasound of the abdomen will be helpful. Although in obvious cases of ascites, you will rely on your clinical examination. The ultrasound of the abdomen will help you to tell you whether there is portal vein thrombosis, what is the uh, uh, echotexture of the liver, you know, whether there is any IVC thrombosis, whether this is a Butt-Chiari uh, syndrome, or, you know, whether there are any other abdominal lymph nodes or any other masses which are presenting within the abdomen. And a chest x-ray and an echocardiogram, depending on whether you suspect the child is in failure or not, is quite an important thing. And then we proceed to the next step, which is the ascitic fluid study. And I feel that in any child with ascites, you know, maybe it may be related to the viral hepatitis. I take that point. But, you know, usually in a child whom you feel, suspect that there is a chronic ascites, an ascitic fluid study is crucial, which is, I think, no different from what the adults would practice. And that, and, and, and you know, the abdominal paracentesis, a couple of points about that is that, you know, you have to use different gauge of needles, otherwise you'll create such a big hole that it will continue leaking for a few days. Even if you do, uh, even if you do, you can just put a bag over it and generally it dries up in a few days. Uh, but the position of it is, I want to be very specific about this because, you know, sometimes there are big spleens in these children and if you do an ascitic tap on the left side, you can cause bleeding in the spleen and we've had, uh, we've burned our fingers with one of those uh, children whom, uh, 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 you know, had to be rescued by surgery. So I think be careful. I would always try and advocate to use the right lower quadrant uh, for tapping of the ascites. The other contentious point is if the INR is abnormal, if the blood products, uh, if the platelet count is abnormal, what should you do? Do you, do you do a tap or not? My simple argument to that is that you do a blood collection in these children. You don't shy away from doing a blood collection with a small uh, cannula, or it's not cannula, but a small butterfly needle. And you should probably use the same technique to do a diagnostic tap in these children with cover of blood products if necessary. But I feel that an ascitic fluid analysis right at the start is important. And I know that there will be differences within the audience about this. 
You look at the sciatic fluid and what you see is a gross appearance and then what tests do you request on the sciatic fluid is quite important as well because it's just not doing the tap but what specific tests are you asking for and, and you know the gross appearance, a cell count, a gram stain and the ascites albumin which is quite important because your gradient will decide which way you will investigate the child further and other tests whenever you are in a clinical suspicion about the problem. The classification of ascites is based on a serum ascites albumin gradient of greater than 1.1 and that's usually the portal hypertension group and the low gradient is the non-portal hypertension group. And you know the high gradient group will have extrahepatic, intrahepatic and posthepatic causes of portal hypertension which you are all very well aware about and I won't go into details about that. But the low gradient there is a host of causes uh, which are there which is nephrotic syndrome right up to the peritoneal carcinomatosis which is not seen in children but is seen in the adults population. One thing is that sometimes we've picked up some hypoalbuminemia secondary to connective tissue disorders, particularly autoimmune diseases, and, and that's something which needs to be suspected. Then you institute a stepwise management of ascites, and in your stepwise management, usually the sodium restriction is the first step that you take. I, I think I would say that you have to be very careful about the fluid restriction. Although we do practice fluid restriction, we have to be very careful to make sure that you are maintaining an effective circulatory blood volume in these children. And then you start with diuretics. I first, is first line always is spironolactone. Second line is frismide. You can either use, uh, uh, you first use spironolactone and then use frismide depending on what staging of your ascites is. If it's 10 societies, there's no point grading it. You know, you have to go with all your guns in and start the child on spironolactone, frismide, fluid, fluid restriction and give 20% albumin infusions along with frismide to help in that. And if that fails, then large volume paracentesis is sometimes essential. What you're aiming for is that you're aiming for a minimal amount of weight loss within the body, and but you're also in aiming for increased urinary sodium excretion. If your child is not losing weight, it's important to check the urinary sodium because if your urinary sodium is low, then your diuretic response is going to be unlikely. You have to be very careful when you use diuretics because you can precipitate hepatorenal syndrome in these children. And, and that's why, you know, careful monitoring of renal function, careful monitoring of urine output and fluid balance is important in these children. Tuberculous societies, you know more than I do, but I thought I'll mention it. And the diagnosis of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is quite important because you can get a child with fever, abdominal pain, and ascites. And if you have abdominal tenderness when you press upon this child's abdomen and you can't find an obvious focus of tenderness, do feel, uh, do raise the suspicion of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in these uh, children. Chylus ascites is a difficult problem to manage. We usually see it in the post-surgical post-liver transplant phenomenon and usually treated with a high protein MCT diet. And if there is no resolution, you will have to resort to PN or octreotide infusions. Uh, I think uh, refractory ascites is something which is unresponsive to medical management. So if you do your step one, step two, step three, and step four, and step five, and still your ascites is not responding, then you know you classify it as refractory ascites, and you do your large volume paracentesis. And the large volume paracentesis, everybody questions how much you should you uh, remove in a large volume paracentesis. And there are clear definitions for that in adults, but in the pediatric settings, those definitions do not exist. And we usually take around, uh, you know, 10 to 20 mils per kilo per day and, uh, and, and wait for other treatments to The one thing is uh, we have come across commonly in our practice is when you treat the ascites and it doesn't improve, then sometimes it's most likely related to Budd-Chiari syndrome and that's where you have to be very suspicious and do the investigations to establish the diagnosis and a TIPS procedure may help or a stretching of the hepatic veins may help. And in uh, early referral to liver transplantation should be considered. In children who have absolutely refractory societies and chylus societies where you know, you've tried all your modalities of treatment and they do not work, then a peritoneal venous shunt we have tried in this situation and that has helped, but it is prone to occlusion, infection, and intestinal obstruction. I think I am not talking about liver transplantation, but there is in, in refractory ascites, there is something new which is coming up. You know, we have exhausted your modalities of treatment of uh, uh, diuretics, waptans or vasopressin receptor antagonists, which act on a different site of the nephron as compared to the standard diuretics are coming up. 
They were initially developed for the treatment of hyponatremia, but they have been shown to improve the control of ascites. And for those of you who will be interested, there's an article published on a multi-center study in August 2010, Journal of Hepatology on this. There are some uh, downsides to using Waptans because, you know, the problems are they cause thirst and, uh, uh, you know, there are other side effects associated with Waptans. So again, they are s restricted uses of uh, Waptans. So in summary, I would like to summarize that, you know, I feel still that in a child with ascites, a diagnostic paracentesis with an appropriate ascitic fluid and analysis is essential in all patients so as to make you the differentiation. And, and you know, ha establishing a serum ascites albumin gradient is useful. Diuretics still remain the first line of treatment with sodium restriction, but close monitoring is necessary. There are newer modalities of treatment available, but please choose the modality of treatment depending on what the underlying cause is. And I feel that in ascites with, uh, you know, where it's not improving, where the underlying cause is liver disease, end-stage liver disease, then the referral for liver transplantation should not be left for uh, too late. I would like to end by acknowledging some of my uh, professors from Bombay who have laid the foundations in pediatrics for me, particularly laid Dr. Barjor Bharucha, from whom I learned a lot, uh, Professor Simen Irani, whom I learned staying outside the ward rounds rather than inside the ward round, and, and Dr. Archana Kher, who was a very... Uh, who has been a very good support for me all throughout my career and other senior pediatricians in Mumbai and India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I welcome all my panelists here on the dais. And I thank Dr. Abba Nagral to bring pediatrics and adult gastroenterology together. It's a good blend. And whenever I used to show pediatric gastroenterology, I would make a triangle. Pediatrics, gastroenterology, and then emergence of pediatric gastroenterology. So we are repeating the model, and it's a wonderful thing. We always learn from adults, but it is not always true. They also learn from us. It's not true. Uh, I will go straight to the panel discussion, and you have to participate. All the people who are here have to participate in this panel discussion. That is how we can avoid our sleep, and we can be attentive. Dr. Garish. What are the bottlenecks in the diagnosis of neonatal cholestasis in England? <laughs> in England, there are no bottlenecks. No, I'm sorry. I don't mean that. The bottleneck, even in England to this date, despite the introduction of the yellow card and community practice, remains late referral. So it's no different from the rest of the world. Although the incidence of late referral is much less than what the incidence of late referral is in India. The second uh, bottleneck, I would say, uh, uh, which was there in the past, which has now resolved, is the establishment of three pediatric hepatology centers within the UK, which means that if a child is suspected with neonatal cholestasis, then instead of having the preliminary investigations done in the uh, uh, district general hospital, the child is usually referred to a tertiary hospital with an interest in pediatric hepatology where investigations can be done promptly and management can be done promptly. So those are the bottlenecks. Dr. Bavdekar, what difficulties do you face in India? Uh, well, the most important is of course the non-availability of tests. It's primarily related to the metabolic liver diseases, which is absolutely not available except for a couple of them. and. In the majority of centers in India, non-availability of a good pathologist to interpret liver biopsies appropriately. I think these are the two most important things I can think of right now. Let us have the feedback from the floor. Your comments. What are your problems in cholestasis? Because I have been delivering more than 45, 50 lectures in the country and everywhere there is a demand for this. Now you have to tell us what are the problems. Do you face any problem, please? Late referrals. Late that, referrals. That is the main thing. Uh, I, in fact, I have seen many pediatricians, they only check bilirubin. They don't check SGPT. <coughs> they check bilirubin for one month, three months, two months, three months. And after three months, jaundice is not subsiding, then they refer. So it's too late by that. How time. early you, do you expect that they should refer the patient to a specialist? Uh, uh, if 15 days, jaundice is not responding, they should uh, refer. Uh, refer the patient. So we take these two messages, and the messages have come from the floor, not from the panelists. We have a uh, case one with a jaundice notice from day five of life. Diaper staining urine, persistently pale stools from birth, 
Do you believe mother's description of stool color? What is the, your response? She is saying your stool is pale in color and she is telling you that uh, diaper staining is there. Do you believe the mother's uh, version or not or you would like to do something more? Please. Believe. Okay. So your response is that you will take it as it is. Now let us have uh, Dr. Neelam Mohan. How will you ensure? Would you believe or you would not believe? Well, actually, to be honest, I uh, wouldn't want to always believe it because I've seen that um, the understanding about yellow stool is quite different. You know, when they bring the stool to me, I don't think it's yellow stool. Right. So therefore, I would always like to see the stool for myself rather than believe the mother because I really Absolutely. burned my hand several times when right. they think it's pigmented. I've not, never found it pigmented. So this is a very important actually pointer for polystasis because on this pointer you are actually approach, further approach will depend. So we are emphasizing on stool color that you should see for yourself. No, no, at the end. <laughs> you keep the questions, you write them and then we can discuss this point. And uh, is the child jaundiced? What are the, what will be your, so you should do stool actually see for yourself in daylight and three consecutive stools should be done. That is how you can ensure really they are pale or they are yellow in color and sometimes you are not able to decide, take it as pale. Don't take it as yellow stool. Right. <laughs> I think one person is good enough for this, for this thing. It is not difficult. What will be your focus on examination, Dr. Neela? Well, when a patient comes to be with jaundice, uh, in the examination, first thing I think on an outlook, I would like to just get an idea like how big is the baby? Is it looking like a preterm baby or is it looking like a full term baby? Fine, fine. And then I'm asking you on examination. Yeah. Let us be specific. And then is the baby sick or is the baby not sick? Right. So these are the uh, things, you know, uh, what is the age and the sickness of the baby? Right. And then I will decide where on examination how the organomegaly is whether there is liver, right. there is spleen, yeah. there is edema, etc. Baby is not sick. So, baby is not sick. What are the things? One is the consecutive stool for three days. They are pale in color. And then also you would like to concentrate on the facial look, cataract and CVS examination. Can you highlight why we are saying these three pointers? Facial look, cataract, CVS examination in this child. Well, facial look generally, if you are in cholestatic patients, uh, it does help a lot. For example, in allergies, you can get paucity, you can yes. have Down syndrome with uh, right. cholestasis. So those facial looks do help us. And then uh, cataract, if you're able to see, then I, am, I, I would be more inclined towards galactosemia Absolutely. patients. Fine. CVS examination, uh, two things. If I'm hearing a murmur, it could be associated with biliary atresia, and it could also be, be if it's a high up murmur, then I'm thinking about a peripheral pulmonary stenosis, which would be in allergies. So uh, CVS is both with biliary atresia and allergies. So that is what I would be looking at. And now in this particular child that you're uh, talking about a jaundice, not sick with, I have seen the stools which are pale. And uh, uh, I'm assume, do I assume there is no cataract and looks are normal in the term baby? Yes, yes. Okay. So in that case, okay, my examination has found to be liver 5 centimeters this and spleen 3. This is what we found. Three. Liver is 5 centimeter, firm in consistency, spleen is enlarged 3 centimeters down. Audience, first possibility, cholestasis, young baby, pale stool, consecutively, liver firm in consistency, spleen 3 centimeters, child is not sick, no other features, first possibility. Wonderful, very good. The message is taken actually, this is... I think we have advanced in India. We are able to make the diagnosis quickly. And Neelam, your possibility? Believe it is here. First possibility. Not that yes. you, will, you have to close yes. your mind. You may have 20% children who may have pale stools, and yet yeah. they are looking no, but all right. This patient unless proved uh, otherwise. The child has to prove himself or herself not to be bilirubinous. Okay, very good. So what specific investigations? We have done already LFT here, and you can see, very yes, please. Can I ask a simple question? Yes. Why do you need to observe stools for three days? If you see uh, stools which are four nappies which are pale, 
that itself is sufficient because you'll save you some time. You modify your guideline. You'll save save your time. The European society you has to modify this gui their guideline. They can actually make their the trial. They can make the actually the recommendation as far as we know so far has been of three consecutive uh, days because there might be fluctuations in that. I, I don't know. Can you can you can tell me? Just as the urine stains the diapers, sometimes the urine stains the stools. And as a uh, resident, is, I was told that is a precaution. That has to be taken. Yes, you please. Split it. You get white pain on the Yeah, I think what's yes. my, my, my my worry is that some of these children have waited for a long time, mm -hmm. and then why wait for three more days? No, no, you are simul you are simultaneously working them up. Okay. See, in my observation, I am sure the doctor usual will also agree with that. We see one color on one day, another day we might be, there may be some fluctuation. There may be fluctuation. But there is a need to look into this aspect, whether we can cut short from three days to one day, where we have to have some kind of a short study to look into that. We find LFT here, LFT is essentially, uh, you can see here, ASTLT is elevated, bilirubin is high, and gamma GT is also high, and prothrombin time is corrected. Uh, next investigation, Neelam. Well, if I have to differentiate, uh, look for uh, malaria trees, yeah, one of the things that we ask for ultrasound is basically to rule out cholidocal, that's very important. And next I would be asking for a fasting ultrasound. Yes. If I'm able to see in a fasting ultrasound, say three and a half to four hours fasting in a baby, a good sized gallbladder which contracts post feed, Why? then that helps me. Otherwise, trying a court sign is not, I mean, though mentioned, everybody is not able to do it. Because our Dr. Zohur is going to elaborate okay. on that point. So we leave it there. We look for triangular court sign. It is not that you just send to a radiologist, do an ultrasound. Please specify what you are interested to look at. You must mention to him, I want cortical cyst, I want gallbladder size contractility, I want triangular court sign. Otherwise, they will give the adult hepatology report. I, B, R, D, and axis, and so many things, and stones. So you ask these specific points to your ultrasonographist. Okay, so the gallbladder is contracted, and there is a triangular core sign, there is no I, B, R, D, there is no cyst. And next investigation, would you agree with this liver biopsy or not? Yes, actually, um, I guess as uh, hepatologists, we are not very fond of getting a HIDA scan done if I've seen a clay stools. Only when in doubt, then we would like to do a, so uh, this thing. Otherwise, I would proceed for a liver biopsy at this Dr. stage. Dr. Gupte, I remember we had a discussion in 2007 here in Bombay, where he did not agree with the liver biopsy. So, Neelam, what is your point? You gave a comment, I still remember, three years back, you gave a comment, yes, we should do it. Yeah. Dr. Gupte? I haven't changed. You have not changed. Okay. <laughs> right. So, Dr. Um, uh, Zahur, could you please uh, tell us uh, what you would like to actually, for biliary atresia, what uh, would be the findings on ultrasound as a surgeon? Well, um, one thing I keep reminding myself and my radiologist is, it, switch off these lights. Hmm. it is not what the radiologist can tell us. It is basically what he's not telling us. You know, that is important. We should look for it. Now, uh, in this ultrasound image of a 36-day-old boy, uh, the biliary cord, the triangular cord sign which is described is basically, uh, if you see the extrapatic biliary radicals, they go towards the porta and branch out and form a cone. Now some take that fibrosis as the sign, however there is a study come wherein they say that the thickness of the portal vein, anterior mm. uh, wall of the portal vein which is in between the two uh, star signs there, if you can just mark them. Okay. That's the right portal vein. And if it is more than 4 mm, they take that as a sign of positivity for periportal fibrosis, and that is suspicious. Similarly here, uh, you can see depiction of the triangular cord sign, the uh, this one. anterior, yeah. The anterior uh, wall of the right portal vein was 5.4 mm thick on this longitudinal ultrasound scan, which sh shows the triangular cord sign between the cursors as a thick tubular structure. So the cutoff is 4 mm, but of course this is not widely accepted and uh, we'd go back that the diagnosis has to be established either by liver biopsy or intraop cholangiogram. Right. Dr. Neelam, what would you focus, what would you ask your histopathologist to do? 
liver biopsy normally we write on the form and said as you mentioned what do you want to ask for so we ask them to comment on the bile duct proliferations and to look at uh, like the, the how many portal tracts you're able to see are the portal tracts widened and the bile ducts how do they look are they seeming proliferated and is the portal to portal bridging portal to portal fibrosis these are classically seen even though you might get to see a few joint cells or a hemopoietic cells that doesn't make a difference these are the three classical things that i would be interested in knowing throughout what is your accuracy rate in your center Pre it is, liver biopsy in uh, at our place in our data, more than 350, we just analyzed it was 96% that we were able Correct. to get it yes. with this. So this child has biliary atresia, pale stools, not sick, ultrasound features, biopsy suggests your biliary atresia. And now we have to operate this patient and I would like to have the comments from Dr. Zohu. What's your comment? What uh, surgery would you do in this right. patient? Basically, our aim of surgery is to establish and confirm the diagnosis of right. biliary atresia. Essentially, it's an exploratory laparotomy. Basically, we are going to explore. The gold standard of diagnosis is intraop cholangiogram along with a liver biopsy. Right. So initially, we do not mobilize the liver too much. There will be a hepatomegaly oh. seen, obviously, clinically. So as soon as we open abdomen oh. through a smaller incision, we try to see where there is a gallbladder. Now, a lot of people say there's no gallbladder, but if you really look hard, there might be a small atretic, and sometimes it is in between the cleft of the liver, so you've got to really look hard for it. If there's a gallbladder, which has got a lumen, then it's easy to do an intraphalangiogram. You aspirate and you check. If you get yellow bile, then of course, uh, you proceed with the cholangiogram. Sometimes you get white aspirate, what we call as white bile. So intraphalangiogram should be essentially done with all precautions, clamping the lower end, giving head high, head low, and making sure there are two aspects to this. Please remember, not only should the intrapedic biliary radicals be seen, but also the dye should be seen to go down into the duodenum. Yes. That is very important. Absolutely. Once we establish the diagnosis, and we know that the dye is not flowing, then the basis of surgery is to establish bile drainage. To do that, we have to remove, uh, do we have the photo of the specimen? Yeah. yeah. This is what I like to see at the end of my surgery. You know, this is a specimen, the lower end, the smaller arrow shows the extra hepatic bile ducts. And they continue, what is seen in the larger arrow, the white arrow is the gallbladder, which is atretic. And in contiguity, we have gone to, between the black cursors is the core. Uh, the extra hepatic bile ducts at the porta. Now the basis of surgery was established by Kasai when you observe that histologically the obliterated extra hepatic bile ducts towards the porta, they have some bile ducts which drain bile. Essentially if the histology shows that the lumen is more than 450 micrometers, then bile drainage can be established. And we create an internal condu which auto approximates by uh, healing. Now this is a schematic diagram. The blue one is the portal vein, the red is the hepatic artery. So surgery, how we define the surgery is we do a wider excision, wider transaction. As we go towards the porta, we like to go well lateral. On the right side, we go as far as the uh, anterior branch of the right hepatic artery. On the left side, up to the umbilical point of the left portal vein. And you remove the core. And uh, make sure you remove the bile ducts without injuring the parenchyma of the liver. These children do not tolerate injury to liver very well. So that is the basis of surgery and of course send it to the lab because the pathologist should be aware where is the upper end and what is the size of the uh, diameter of the bile ducts. That will determine results of surgery. Oh. Right, okay. We go to case two. So this was a case of biliary atresia that was operated. And we go to case two. This is 72 days old child. Jaundice notice day 10 of life. Intermittent pale and pigmented stools. Here you see fluctuations in stool color. Overfeeding, pale stools. Um, thereafter, high TLC. Treated with antibiotics. Responded. Birth weight 3 kgs. Weight gain this much. Not sick. Ictus. Mild pallor. Liver 4 centimeters. Spleen 2 centimeters. Now, wh what we have actually, we have fluctuations in stool color, we have got high TLC, we have got history of poor feeding. Ashish, you are coming. Quick. 
Well, I think this really is, could be any case of neonatal cholestasis, except it's extremely unlikely that this is a biliary atresia. Okay. Based on this, I'm not sure we'll be able to say whether it's a idiopathic neonatal hepatitis or metabolic liver disease or bile duct paucity. It's NCS, unlikely to be biliary atresia, but will require a workup to find out the etiology. Doctor, sir. Doctor Shankar Narayan. See, the crux of the problem here is a child at 72 days old of having a firm liver and, of course, intermittent pills too. Yes. It's not a complete cholestasis. Okay. So, the chances of the possibilities could be intrahepatic or it can still be extrahepatic okay. with the intermittent obstructions. Dr. Zohur, what would you think? Uh, in this patient. Biliary atresia essentially is an infantile disease. No, no. This, in this, what is this is patient, day, day 10 child. I would not rush into any operative uh, uh, no, this. What, what condition, so surgical condition you would think of in yeah, this patient? No, I would like to think either positive of uh, that is allergic, syndromic or non-syndromic or even a cholidocal. You see, but cholidocal yes, is essentially nowadays an antenatal diagnosis. Fight, fight. No, that is fine. So, you have actually evidence of infection here, your fluctuation, at least there seems to be out. They don't develop pre-surgery sort of a fever, unless they have decompensation and then SVP because of that. So, we agree with that. So, it was, the question is cyst or because he is infected, there might be a possibility of galaxidemia and others. So, these are the investigations. Coglopathy is correctable. And you can see albumin is low, AST, LTR, high, bilirubin is very high. And then we go to the ultrasound because we have to rule out cold cyst, good size contractile gallbladder, bilateral intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation, cyst at the portal. So this was the diagnosis of cold cyst here. So pre, uh, actually these patients who are coming with fever, recurrent, cholangitis sort of a thing, and they have cholestasis, intermittency, think of cold because it is very easy to treat these patients. Management and follow-up, we know the thing is ruined by hepatocogeogenostomy, LFT normal on follow-up, organomegaly regressed, weight gain adequate. And uh, do you get, Dr. Zahur, late referral for cholestasis because they are just like cholestasis? Yeah, yeah, we do, in fact, uh, all the, the triad of uh, cholestasis that described in textbooks was described in older patients, you know, right. the history of jaundice, pain, and uh, lump. And before the era of ultrasound, it was a common presentation and surgery in older children is more difficult because there is a there are history of cholangitis in the past there is a lot of adhesions a lot of fibrosis it's really a bloody operation unlike that in the neonatal age group what would be the optimum age uh, you would like to operate earliest in, in the see if it is antenatal diagnosis in the first half of the first year definitely I would like to you go back. for six months? No, we would not. It depends on the presentation. How is the, if the LFTs are not deteriorating, then I would operate in the first month. Because okay. first month is physiological uh, changes. Then within the first six weeks of life is, is good enough to operate. Surgery is quite safe. Right. Okay, fine. Then we go to case three. 90 days old child. John just noticed at day 18 of life. Pigmented stool. Birth weight 2.3 kgs. Not sick. All consecutive stools are pigmented, liver is soft in consistency, spleen 2 centimeters. Ashish, your comment on diagnosis. <coughs> well, again, I think it's the same as last time. I'm just more likely to exclude a biliary atresia, but it could be any of the other causes of neonatal cholestasis. I cannot on the basis of this.